Welcome to the University of Bristol's short course on epigenetic epidemiology. We want everyone to get the most they possibly can out of this course, so we've developed two online lectures to introduce some basic concepts. When you come to Bristol in a few weeks, we'll build on this basic knowledge to learn how epigenetic data can be used in epidemiological studies. In this first lecture, we discuss what we mean by epigenetics, some classic examples of epigenetics in other species, and why epigenetics might be interesting to epidemiologists. Over the past few years, there's been a lot of discussion about epigenetics in the scientific literature as well as in the popular press. Much of the interest comes from the idea that epigenetics bridges the gap between genetics and the environment. However, there's still a lot of confusion about what epigenetics is and what impact it has. There are lots of different interpretations of the term epigenetics, but a generally agreed definition is that it is the study of mitotically heritable changes to gene expression that occur without changes in DNA sequence. Put another way, epigenetics is the study of how genes are turned on or off by mechanisms that can persist through generations of cells, but that don't affect the underlying genetic architecture. The genetic architecture, or genome, remains basically the same throughout our lives, so monozygotic twins are genetically identical at birth, but also in adulthood. However, their epigenomes will become increasingly different over time. And this happens because, in addition to being influenced by the underlying genetic architecture, the genome, the epigenome can also be influenced by environmental exposures. And these environmental exposures can include exposure to diseases, such as type 2 diabetes, obesity, infection and cancer. Epigenetic changes can also occur randomly over time. Here's a quick exercise to check your understanding so far. Pause the video and think about which of the following statements about epigenetics are true. Here are the answers. Statement 1 is false and statement 2 is true. Epigenetic mechanisms influence gene expression without changing the DNA sequence. Statement 3 is true. Epigenetic mechanisms can be influenced by the environment. But changes to the epigenome can also occur randomly over time, so statement 4 is false. Statement 5 is true. One of the key features of epigenetic mechanisms is that they can survive cell division, i.e. they're mitotically heritable. And statement 6 is false. The epigenome is strongly influenced by the underlying genetic architecture. So to recap, the true statements are 2, 3 and 5. There are several biological mechanisms that fulfil the definition of epigenetic. These include covalent modifications, where chemical groups change the way DNA is read by either attaching to the DNA itself or to the histone proteins that DNA is wrapped around. Other epigenetic mechanisms include chromatin re remodelling complexes, which move the DNA and histones to make the chromatin more or less dense, wrapping the DNA around different forms of histone proteins from those that are normally used, and various types of non-coding RNAs, including microRNAs, which attach to the gene's transcripts to silence genes after transcription. In this course, we will mostly focus on DNA methylation because it's the most widely studied epigenetic mechanism and the most easy to study in the context of epigenetic epidemiology. DNA methylation involves the addition of methyl groups to cytosine in DNA. This turns the cytosine into 5-methyl cytosine. The methyl group is added to the cytosine at the fifth carbon atom. A cytosine attached to a methyl group is said to be methylated. In animals, DNA methylation happens almost exclusively at cytosines, Cs, next to guanine, Gs, which are called CPG sites. The P just means that there's a phosphate bond between the C and the methyl group. There are about 30 million CPGs in the human genome. CPG sites tend to be clustered in CPG islands, often at the promoter regions of genes, which is where the transcription machinery binds. 
When DNA is methylated in the promoter region of a gene, this usually blocks transcription of the gene and leads to gene silencing, so the gene is effectively switched off or inactive. When DNA methylation occurs outside of the promoter region, in intergenic regions or at repetitive elements, its primary role might be to maintain genomic integrity rather than change gene expression. Here are some examples of epigenetics in action. Firstly, we know that epigenetic mechanisms, especially DNA methylation, play a huge role in cell differentiation. Each of your cells has the same DNA, the same genotype, but although they have the same DNA, they don't all do the same thing with it. Epigenetic mechanisms can tell cells what to do with the DNA, i.e. which genes to switch on and which to switch off. And the genes that are chosen to be expressed in a cell define the function of that cell, so a nerve cell will have different epigenetic modifications compared to a muscle cell or a fat cell. Aside from cellular phenotype, epigenetic mechanisms can also have a huge effect on physiology, behaviour and appearance. For example, although queen, drone and worker bees are all identical in genetic sequence, they are strikingly different in their phenotypes. Queen bees can produce as many t as 2,000 eggs in a single day, whereas workers are sterile. Workers spend their days foraging for food, collecting pollen, maintaining the hive and fighting off invaders, while queen bees spend their days having food delivered to them and laying eggs to keep the hive populated with enough workers. Queen bees are five times larger than worker bees and their lifespan is typically 20 times longer. These dramatic differences begin when the bees are larvae. They're all fed a diet of royal jelly by nursa bees. Worker bees are rapidly weaned onto a diet of nectar and pollen, but queen bees are bathed in royal jelly throughout development and continue to eat it as adults. Royal jelly inhibits an, en an enzyme that adds methyl groups to DNA. That is, it inhibits DNA methylation. So the dramatic differences between different types of bees from the same colony are caused by differences in DNA methylation. Finally, a classic example of epigenetics in action is the agouti mouse. These two individuals are genetically identical. The only difference is that they have different DNA methylation at a very small region of the genomes near the agouti gene. This gene controls hair colour and is also involved in metabolism. The brown mice are lean and healthy and have a methylated region upstream that leads to higher expression of the agouti gene, i.e. the gene is switched on. If that region is unmethylated, the gene is switched off and the mouse is this nice strawberry blonde colour, fat and has metabolic problems. Epigenetic mechanisms can be influenced by the environment and have the potential to cause long-lasting changes to gene expression, so they're interesting to study because they might, firstly, provide a biological mechanism through which environmental exposures can cause diseases, either soon after the exposure or later in life. Secondly, they might provide a long-lasting indication of a particular exposure, for example to smoking. Thirdly, they might provide a useful tool to diagnose or to predict future health and disease outcomes. And fourthly, they might provide potential drug targets to prevent or treat disease. We will discuss these potential applications in more detail on the main course in Bristol. Thank you for watching pre-course lecture one. We recommend watching any sections that you're unclear on, but please remember that this is just an introduction and we will discuss epigenetic mechanisms in more detail on the main course. When you're happy with the material covered in pre-course lecture one, we invite you to move on to watch pre-course lecture two, where we will discuss how epidemiological approaches can help us to understand the role of epigenetics in health and disease.